It's interesting when I hear you talk about your works, as in that one is a reference to the Book of the Dead. And the book you talked earlier that the children could read, you start with a myth that's told in many cultures around the world, titles like The Selfish Gene. I mean, clearly you're an excellent scientist, but you're also very good at marketing. Do you think about when you write a book that I need to find a way to capture an audience with curiosity in order for them to then digest the ideas, consciously or subconsciously? Well, I suppose any writer ought to be putting themselves in the position of the reader and thinking how to how to influence the reader, I suppose. Um, yes, I mean, I, mean I, I love the English language and, and, and I've practiced how to deploy it. Did anyone teach you how to be a good writer in that sense? I don't know about that. I mean, I... Because most scientists aren't good writers, per se. There wasn't an English department at MIT. I know that. <laughs> um, every Oxford student has to write an essay every week. There you go. Um, and um, in my time, we had to read it aloud. Ooh. And so we had to, um, I suppose, get a feel for the cadences of language. How does that change writing when you have to read it aloud? And from well, the feedback perspective and then I, from the I think you, you make it a bit of a performance I and mean, you don't drone it. You, 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 if, if you, you try to read it with expression and I suppose that helps to um, give color to it. Nowadays they tend to hand them essays in which, which is more hard work for the, t for the tutor and, and in some ways it might be less education from the point of view of fostering a sense of English style, perhaps. Do you think that made your books better? When the fact that you had to read them out in the beginning and change your writing style? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I would be surprised. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed with Flights of Fancy is it's so readable. It feels like anyone can pick this up and read it. It doesn't feel like you're talking down to me. It feels like you're engaging me in this very interesting, mysterious story without talking, like I said, above me or making things complicated. Is that an intentional writing style? Of course. I mean, um, yeah. we, we, every, every author ought to want to be understood. Yeah. I suspect there are some authors who don't want to be understood because they sort of feel that if they are unintelligible, they, they'll be thought to be profound. And that's, what, that's, a, in, in, that's a hypocrisy which lies at the root of, I fear, some academic disciplines. Right. So you always the virtue of obscurity, which is, which is pernicious. So you always make sure you don't do that. You want to make this. Absolutely. Right. Yes. You want them to see right. Anyone can pick this up and see right through you to see the ideas. Certainly. And language um, doesn't get in the you, way. You, you open a page of Charles Darwin and you can immediately see this is somebody who really, really wants to be understood. Right. Uh, um, and how would one not? But, but there are plenty of people, not that, well, there, are, there are people who positively don't want to be understood. They want to be thought to be profound. I've heard people say that writing is rewriting. Do you agree with that? I'm not quite sure what it means, but um, <laughs> what do you think they mean by that? Is that if you want to craft something that is a piece of work that can have meaning, it means you need to continually refine oh, it. Oh, of course, absolutely. Right. Uh, I mean, almost every, all, all my time is spent rewriting, yes. Okay. And I've also heard writers that have been on the show <laughs> said that Writing a book is the loneliest thing. Yes. Um, sometimes when I've written a paragraph that I've been particularly pleased with, I, I want to share it with somebody. <laughs> so I confess to that. And do you or do you hold off? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yes, yes. But can it be lo lonely when you're inside your head trying to get out an idea you have and only I you can beat yourself up until so, it's correct? Yes, I suppose that's right. <clears throat> <clears throat> I do, um, when I'm writing, I do imagine it being read by a particular individual. It'll be a different individual. Um, like an avatar, a certain type of person. Yes, and I, I don't do it consciously. I don't say, today I'm going to read this through the eyes of so-and-so. But it just happens that I am imagining that person. Um, Oddly enough, I do it sometimes, if, if I've just sent a chapter to a particular colleague um, and I've pressed send and it's gone to him, um, 
it's too late to change it as far as he's concerned, but I nevertheless then read it again through his eyes. And say, oh, I wonder what he'll, I wonder what he'll make of that. Oh, hey, I, did, I should have thought that better, you know, and, and then, I, then I do change it. Um, so that, that's one of the um, avatars that, uh, the one way to get to get one, which is, is, is a, but it also just may happen to be somebody I've just spoken to on the phone, and he's in my, or she's in my head, and so, I imagine, I imagine her reading it, right. and and then say, well, okay, that she wouldn't like that. I'm going to change that. And, and um, will you ever stop writing books? Or for you, is it kind of like water and air and food and writing? Oh, I've no intention of stopping. The greedy bankers are about to do it again. In 2008 they crashed our financial system and nearly bankrupted the entire global economy. Then they received trillions of dollars in government bailouts. And after, they demanded fat bonuses paid for by you, the taxpayer. It turns out the banks haven't just been screwing the American taxpayers, they're also screwing over their investors. Turns out uh, the banking industry is the worst place you could put your money, despite enormous taxpayer bailouts. Now the bankers are back to take away your financial freedom. They lie and tell you that cryptocurrency isn't safe. They try to make it illegal for you to choose how to invest your hard-earned money. They lie and say cryptocurrency is used by money launderers and criminals. But look at the record. It's the banks themselves that launder hundreds of billions of dollars every year to the biggest criminal operations in the world. Leaked documents have revealed how some UK banks have helped criminals, money launderers and Russians under sanctions. American authorities discovered that the Sinaloa cartel moved $881 million through HSBC accounts as bank officials turned a blind eye to the illegality. The bankers lie and say cryptocurrency is not a real investment. Meanwhile, the smartest CEOs in the world are buying billions and billions of it. The truth is that banks lie about cryptocurrency because it makes them scared. The banks take $9 trillion per year of your hard-earned money, and they are worried that they will finally be exposed. They're scared because crypto means they can no longer control your money, which means they can no longer control you. They are scared because you might actually understand your money and intelligently decide what to do with it. Now is the time for us to come together, fight back, and take control. It's time to educate ourselves, our families, and our communities. Because financial education means financial freedom. We know that cryptocurrencies will help us build the new decentralized financial system of the future. A banking system that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. A banking system where access to finance is a fundamental human right. A banking system that is free and fair and welcomes all humans on this earth. The DeFi revolution is happening. We, the people, can no longer be fooled. We choose to take control of our finances. We choose to take control of our freedom. We choose to take control of our future. Join us and let's take back our financial freedom forever. <laughs>